Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Eric Daly, a uh, corporate partner with Miller Johnson. Thank you for joining us on December 30th for the final uh, Miller Johnson COVID-19 update webinar of this calendar year. Uh, we'll certainly be happy to move from 2020 into 2021. And um, we, we appreciate those of you in particular who have been frequent participants in our webinars. We will continue them into 2021. Um, I guess that's bittersweet because it means that COVID is, is uh, continuing to impact all of our, our lives, but um, this gives us a way to stay in touch with one another and uh, in the spirit of our, our past webinars on COVID-19 to uh, share information, um, collaborate together and in whatever small way we can as the lawyers contribute to uh, response uh, to COVID-19, uh, we'll continue to do that and continue to be thankful for, for those who are playing a more direct role and a more important role in public health response to COVID-19. Um, so thank you. Uh, hope you enjoy your transition to the new year. And for our last webinar topic of 2020, we will be talking about a, a new Small Business Administration or SBA program called uh, the Shuttered Venue Operator Grant Program or SVO Grant Program. And we can move to the next slide to kind of go through today's topics. We'll go through an overview of what this new program is. It's not the same as the PPP although there are some similarities between those two programs. Um, talk about, you know, who are the, what types of entities and individuals are eligible grant recipients potentially, how you calculate your grant amount, the possibility that there, there could be supplemental grants, and then um, go through kind of what expenses an eligible grantee could could use those amounts for and what types of expenses are prohibited. In general, I'll say if you're familiar with the PPP categories of expenses, the the eligible expenses under this SVO, the, the shuttered venue operator grant program are gonna be broader, generally speaking. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about um, how grant awards are going to be prioritized based on need uh, over the first four weeks of the program administration and then uh, cover some tax considerations um, along the same lines as uh, the, the PPP related tax issues that have come up over the last eight, nine months. So with that, we'll jump right into it. Um, as I mentioned, this is a new SBA or Small Business Administration program, and uh, $15 billion have been appropriated under the latest stimulus bill for this particular program. Uh, in addition to that, or stay apart from that, there's you know over $280 billion for the new round for the revived paycheck protection program. So this is a relatively small amount compared to the, the PPP appropriation, but it's still a very meaningful, obviously $15 billion. We'll see how far that goes um, toward funding the, uh, the grant applications, but um, just wanted to note the, the relative disparity in size between this and the PPP, just as people think about the likelihood of getting funded and, and how SBA might prioritize uh, loan or grant recipients beyond the, uh, the priority set forth in the actual legislation. Um, for the first 60 days, and this is relevant to the, the point that I just made, 
uh, two billion of that fifteen billion will be set aside or reserved for um, grant recipients that have fifty or fewer full time equivalent employees. So for some period of time, and I think this addresses uh, one of the criticisms that was leveled against the and has been leveled against the PPP. For some period of time, there will be from the get-go here a set aside for the, the smaller, uh, in terms of employee size anyway, the smaller grant recipients. And while the SVO program is similar to the PPP in some respects, it is just to be 100% clear, it is not the same. It's not like a subset of the PPP or a separate arm of the PPP is its own program. Uh, I, as far as I know, and we'll see what SBA does with implementing the SBO grant program, but the legislation contemplates that these are direct grants from SBA. So um, we'll see to what extent, if any, banks and lenders get involved in that process. They're, they're, may need to be some coordination just because um, as we'll get to a little later uh, if, if a borrower under the PPP gets a new loan going forward they would not be eligible for an SVO grant so there's some level of coordination that needs to happen there but I don't believe that SVO grants will be originated in the same way that PPP loans were by working through, you know, your your banking relationship or other other bank, I think it'll be a direct application process with the SBA. But again, we'll see once the uh, program implementing rules and regulations start to get rolled out by SBA. The maximum amount of an SBO grant is also calculated differently than the maximum amount of a PPP loan. The, the Paycheck Protection Program loan, for those who are not familiar with that program, is basically calculated as a multiple of the borrower, the PPP borrower's average monthly payroll costs over a particular period, whereas um, the amount of a grant under the SVO program is not based on payroll costs, based more as we'll see later on a, a revenue type concept. Um, so, on that point, there's less of an emphasis under the grant program. In fact, there's nothing in the statute, for example, that requires a certain amount of the or a certain percentage of the grant to be spent on payroll, uh, nor is there any concept of returning grant funds if, if, if full-time equivalent employee levels declined, things like that. So. The kind of guiding principle uh, in the PPP related to maintaining payroll and full-time equivalent employees is um, not as central. In fact, it's largely absent from the, the legislation dealing with the SVO grants. So that's an important difference. And again, we'll see if SBA changes or colors that in any way when they implement the rules and regulations for the program, they weren't shy about adding in additional requirements or eligibility criteria, for example, when they first rolled out the PPP. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. And then um, lastly, we'll cover this in a uh, relatively high level of detail, but there are different types of eligible recipients and broader ca categories of eligible expenses that these SBO grants can be used for. In terms of potentially eligible SBO grant recipients, the list includes live venue operators and promoters, theatrical producers, live performing arts organization operators, certain museums, and I believe zoos, um, motion picture movie theater operators and um, talent representatives. Uh, the, the genesis of the SVO grant program was, I believe, a separate piece of legislation that was floated 
um, in Congress over the summer called the Save Our Stages Act, I think is what the name of the standalone bill was. And so a lot of the provisions that ended up in the SBO grant program sort of have, have their origin in that Save Our Stages program. So a lot of the, the eligible borrowers are focused on you know, live performance areas, theatrical productions, performing arts areas, but then it was also expanded to include places like museums or zoos and movie theaters. Um, so each of those categories, you probably have a conception in our head, uh, sort of a common sense idea of what each of those categories um, might be. But there are detailed uh, eligibility criteria um, to, to be able to receive an SVO grant as one of those types of entities or individuals. I'm going to go through on the next few slides sort of a non-exhaustive summary of some of these key requirements just to give you a sense of, you know, as you're thinking through whether you might be eligible, be really satisfied, how are you going to fit in to be eligible in one of these categories based on, on some of these criteria. Um, and uh, we'll obviously, again, keep an eye on the SBA rulemaking to see if they're tightened or loosened at all, because some of them are are in my mind at least relatively uh, stringent criteria. So for example, uh, to be a live, to qualify for a live performance venue and get an SVO grant, you need to have a defined performance and audience space, mixing equipment, a public address system and a lighting rig. Um, if you read the statute um, kind of based on just its plain wording and requirements, seems to require that you must have a lighting rig. I don't know if that, you know, they're really going to drill down to this level of detail in terms of making grants available to borrowers. I, I would hope having or not having a lighting rig wouldn't make the difference between getting or not getting a an SBO grant, but it just, I include that just to underscore that there, there are stringent requirements here, at least on the face of the law for um, being eligible. And then you see some of these other criteria that you have to have at least two, uh, two of the following roles, sound engineer, a booker, promoter, stage manager, security, box office manager. You need to have somebody or more than one person in two of those roles. Uh, you need to have a paid ticket or cover charge type concept with an exception for, for nonprofits. Uh, artists need to be paid fairly and not be performing mainly for tips. And then there needs to be a marketing of the performances through you know, social media or um, online listings or emails. So it's not, you know, it's not just an open-ended kind of concept that, hey, I've got a theater space where, you know, our, our community theater puts on shows from time to time. So we're definitely eligible. You need to go through and actually make sure that you're either hitting the right boxes or qualify for an, an exemption. Um, for motion, for movie theaters, motion picture theaters, um, there are, I think, more common sense or more straightforward criteria. Um, you need an auditorium and a screen with fixed audience seating a projection space and a projector, um, paid ticket structure. And then uh, again, you need to be marketing, promoting your, your movie show times through some specified channels. Uh, museums, there's a, a statutory definition that the, the stimulus bill references. I won't get into a huge amount of detail there, um, but you need to be a museum as your principal business activity. So you can't can't be, you know, a for-profit business that has, you know, uh, like the Museum of Coca-Cola History or something in the corner of their corporate headquarters, right? It has to be the primary business, or the principal business activity has to be your museum um, first, and maybe you have some retail or something in there. But if your principal business activity is being museum, then then that ticks the first box. You have to have an indoor exhibition space with some kind of uh, that's been subject to some kind of COVID-related occupancy restrictions, and then you also need to have at least 
one auditorium theater performance or lecture hall with fixed seating and regular programming. I think most museums probably have something that fits into that category, but not not everything that we would think of as you know a museum that would likely be eligible may they may not necessarily have that uh, when when you first think about it at least at face value. So that's that's one criteria that's a little bit um, maybe counterintuitive or, or not necessarily intuitive for museum eligibility. And then a uh, museum cannot be a for-profit entity. Uh, so it can't be like a for-profit tourist museum of some kind. Um, it has to be a not-for-profit uh, entity. And then talent representatives, um, you have to be basically engaged in representing artists and entertainers for at least 70% of your operations. And that the act doesn't really specify how you would measure that, but basically needs to be your your primary job, right? Is you're booking you're booking performers, musicians, comedians, actors at live performing venues or at festivals. And um, the, the performers need to be paid based on either a number of tickets sold or on some other similar basis. So I think there's a, probably some rulemaking or FAQs that need to be adopted for all these categories to help fill in some of the gaps and address some of the questions that people and business or um, grant recipients are inevitably going to have about one or more areas where they could be in a gray area for satisfying the different criteria. But again, the overall point is just definitionally, it, it's not, uh, to me anyway, uh, the most intuitive definitions that are being used here. Um, there are some, some pretty technical uh, eligibility criteria. Okay, and so assuming that you do in fact satisfy one of those definitions as a kind of a first order issue, you are a museum or you are a, um, a movie theater, say, to be actually eligible to receive a grant, you have to have been fully operational, uh, not entirely clear what that means, but let's assume that that has it just means you're operating in the normal course, let's say for now, although we'll see if SBA gives any guidance about what that really means. But you must have been fully operational on February 29th, 2020. And you must have experienced a 25% reduction in your gross earned revenue. Um, and this does mirror the new PPP uh, round two loan criteria you have to have had a reduction of 25% in your gross earned revenue during any quarter of 2020 compared to that same quarter in 2019. So if in the second or third quarter of 2020 or in the fourth quarter, in any quarter, but for a lot of borrowers, it'll be in the second or third quarter, I would suspect when things were really the most shut down, um, you would take a look at your uh, decline in gross earned revenue, and then look at the same quarter in 2019. And if you have more than 25% reduction and you were fully operational at February 29th, then you're, you know, you're still tracking for eligibility at that point. Uh, as of the date of the grant, you must intend to reopen or resume your operations when, you know, when you're possibly able to do so subject to you know, state and local safety requirements and the like, or, or you know, you have an intention to do that, um, or maybe you've already been able to do that, depending on what state or locality you're in. That is another uh, requirement. Is that basically you can't you can't have shut down permanently. You intend to reopen at some point, and then um, you cannot be owned or controlled by a publicly traded company. And um, in 2019, you can't have received 10% or more of your gross revenue from federal funding. Um, interestingly, on the topic of kind of government involvement, there's nothing that excludes, um, and actually there's language in the, the act that specifically includes state and local owned um, entities to be eligible for grants. So, uh, if you had a um, 
a, t- a town that owned its own performance space and otherwise satisfied all the criteria, or if you had a state performance uh, venue that was owned by the state that otherwise satisfied the criteria and didn't receive more than 10% of its revenue from federal funding, then that, that any probably would still be eligible. Um, whereas in the PPP context, government owned entities are generally not eligible. So um, that's a, another difference potentially between these two programs. Another requirement is that the recipient cannot have or be majority owned or controlled by another entity ha- that has, um, in the way the, the statute is written, it says more than two of the following characteristics. Um, and then there are three characteristics listed. So more than two would be all three. I don't know if that was a drafting error, but basically uh, the way it's written, at least on its face, is you could have two of these characteristics and still be eligible. If you had all three, you would not be eligible for a grant. Uh, I don't know if that was intentional, how they wrote it. It seems like that's probably not what they intended, but it's the way it's written. Um, so in any case, the way, at least the way it's presently written, if you own or operate a venue in more than one country, own and operate venues in more than 10 states, and you employ more than 500 full-time equivalent or employed more than 500 full-time equivalent employees as of February 29th, 2020, then you would be ineligible. But if, if you only hit on two of those, then you're still eligible. So we'll see how that's implemented by SBA um, at the end of the day. That's one to keep an eye on. Um, but basically the idea is we're, they're, not, they're trying to exclude you know, the very largest or the, whether that's geographically or um, in terms of employees, uh, excluding those uh, entities from receiving grants. And then uh, we received a question, I believe, about this last point here before the webinar. Um, if you already received the PPP loan that, you know, prior to December 27th, that will not uh, prevent you from receiving uh, shuttered venue operator grants going forward. But, but going forward, you can't receive either a first or second draw PPP loan and an SVO grant. So from here on in, you have to choose one or the other. Whatever you may have done before, if you got a PPP loan, that won't impact whether you can get an SVO grant or it shouldn't impact whether you can get an SVO grant. Um, but, but moving forward, you can't participate in both programs, whether as a first-time borrower or a second-time borrower under the PPP. So you, you should kind of look at both programs and figure out which one is going to be a better fit. I suspect for many, uh, many of the types of entities or um, businesses, museums and things that are in this, that are eligible for an SVO grant, they're probably going to be better off with the SVO program, uh, but still worth taking a close look at. If you have very large payroll costs, but relatively low revenues in 2019, it might might work out the other way that the PPP is still better for you, but um, that's going to be an individual determination for every potential business or every potential entity. Okay, um, and then I think this is the last slide with eligibility uh, issues addressed. The the grant recipient still needs to make the this uh, need certification that PPP. Uh, borrowers or advisors are probably familiar with, even though there is a kind of a bright line revenue test, that 25% revenue decline test, the borrower still needs to make a certification that uh, in good faith, they believe that the uncertainty of current economic conditions makes the grant necessary to support their ongoing operations. Um, And that's important uh, because it introduces a, an element of subjectivity into, you know, your eligibility. You want to make sure that you've given that issue some consideration. Then, in a PPP context, the main considerations 
that SBA said were important in evaluating whether a, a borrower of a PPP loan could make that certification would be things like its uh, liquidity. So if they already had a lot of cash on hand, that might mean that you know the loan might not be as necessary if they had if you had access to some other source of financing uh, outside of uh, your cash on hand, like a line of credit or something, that that might be a relevant factor. Uh, and then your expected level of business activity going forward would also, of course, be a relevant factor. So there's no, there in the PPP context, there's still no bright line tests other than uh, they, they introduced a safe harbor for many of the quote unquote smaller borrowers with loans below $2 million. So if you're if you're going to be kind of at the high end of the borrowing range, under the SVO in particular, in particular, you want to make sure that you have developed a record of, you know, why you believe um, the uncertainty of current economic conditions makes the grant necessary to support your operations. Next, you cannot receive a grant if you're in the business of marketing or exhibiting. Uh, prurient or you know, sexual oriented um, content. Uh, so this would be things like, uh, I guess a strip club might otherwise uh, qualify if they have a lighting rig, I guess, and some of the other criteria. But um, this, this aspect of the, uh, of the uh, legislation would, would make that type of business ineligible. And uh, that actually was is something that's been litigated under the PPP um, and resolved in, in favor of uh, the loan recipients in that context, uh, although in a slightly different context because there were the, the statute itself in that case did not include this limitation, whereas here the limitation is included. Um, but we'll move on from that. If that's an issue for anybody, you can reach out directly and, and we can talk about it, but um, I think they're trying to bolster the ineligibility of those entities by including the, ex uh, the exclusion right in the statute. And then uh, this is probably more important or relevant to the folks. The, the maximum number of affiliated entities that can, that can receive grants under this program is five. So, um, you have a number of different companies set up to operate a kind of a common business. At least the way the statute's written, um, you could have multiple entities that are affiliated together and under common control, each apply for and receive a grant. And there doesn't appear to be, at least in the statute, any aggregate affiliate based limitation on the grant size, um, but you couldn't have more than five of those companies that are affiliated together apply for and receive grants. So we'll see. I think there's definitely going to need to be some guidance provided by SBA there about how you implement those concepts um, and making sure that there's not a limit, for example, on each of those five entities receiving the, you know, uh, the maximum loan uh, grant size or grants that in the aggregate are above $10 million. Um, so probably more to come on that particular issue. The affiliation concept was uh, one that was always very, very much a sticky wicket in the, the PPP program and, and maybe here as well. So, okay, assuming that you haven't been ruled out of eligibility based on any of those five or six or probably more slides that I just went through. And you go to calculate your maximum grant amount. Your initial grant will generally be equal to 45% of your gross earned revenue during 2019, subject to a $10 million cap per grant recipient. Um, one exception to that is that the legislation specifically calls out that for museum operators, that $10 million cap is applied to all museums operated by the same museum operator. So if you had, I guess, 
multiple branches of the same type of museum in different cities or something like that, or even in the same city, uh, they would need to be aggregated together. But that rule, at least again, on the face of the legislation is limited to museums. Um, and then there's a special calculation rule for your grant size if you started operations during 2019, since you then, um, you know, you wouldn't have a full year of gross earned revenues. So you want to be aware of that if, if you started your operations at some point during 2019, there's a different calculation. It gets you to kind of the same place conceptually, but just a different number crunching exercise. Okay, and then uh, supplemental grants. So if the SBA it gets through uh, its process of either funding or determining that initial grant applicants during that first 60 day period after they launch the program, if they get through all that, fund them or determine they're ineligible, then the program will open up to potentially to supplemental grants to prior SVO grant recipients. Um, in general, to be eligible for the supplemental grant, there's going to need to be some pretty meaningful continued decline in your your revenues and in, into Q1 of 2021 compared to Q1 of 2019. Uh, and basically, it's got to be at least 70% uh, decline compared to the first quarter of 2019. So if you're still, you know, way, way below the level you were at in that first quarter of 2019 and when you get to the end of the first quarter of 2021 then you're you're likely eligible for the supplemental grant if there are still funds available and that would generally be equal to 50 percent of your initial grant however there's an overall limit that 10 million dollar limit would apply to both the original grant plus the supplemental grant so in a you know just to use a simple case if you receive an $8 million initial grant, the most you could get um, in the supplemental grant would be 2 million. That would be eight plus two is 10 million. Um, you couldn't get the 4 million. That would be the 50% of your original 8 million. Um, and then I think we covered this last point already that it'll, one, it'll take a while to stand up the, the program here and then uh, they won't be processing the supplemental grant requests until uh, at least 60 days have gone by in any case. So that that will be uh, out on the horizon sometime, presumably after Q1, since uh, you need to know what your Q1 2021 revenues are to be eligible. Okay, um, there's a lot of a lot of language on this slide. I'm not going to go through all of it uh, in any kind of level of detail, but. Basically, there are, there are quite a few categories of eligible expenses that you can use these grants for. They're similar, but not identical to the types of forgivable PPP expenses that some folks might be familiar with already. Um, they're generally broader. Uh, for example, the, um, the uh, SBO grants could be used to pay up to $100,000 toward independent contractor payments, whereas PPP loans can't be used for that purpose at all. Um, and then there's a whole kind of catch-all category of other ordinary and necessary business expenses with numerous examples provided in the legislation. So just big picture, there, there are quite a few categories of eligible expenses. I, I don't think that will be a big constraint for eligible grant recipients, but if you do um, receive an SBO grant, you want to be careful that anything that you uh, claim you've used the SBO grant for does fall into one of these categories. And then, in terms of the time frame for eligible expenses, it's really any of those categories of eligible expenses that were incurred from March 1st, 2020 through the end of 2021. And then if you get an, um, a supplemental grant, it extends for another six months through June 30th, 2022. So it's pretty lengthy time frame, which again is more favorable than uh, the PPP, 
which has a max of 24 weeks for a kind of a forgiveness eligibility period. So all else equal, this would come down and, you know, probably in favor of using the SBO grant program rather than the PPP if you were eligible for both. This would be more flexible in terms of what you can spend the money on and when. Um, in terms of that start date for the window to spend the funds, March 1st, 2020, uh, obviously there's some retroactivity there for funds that have already been spent. I think the SBA is going to need to, they're going to need to detail a lot more in terms of the procedure for how you validate these expenses and things like that. But um, that one in particular, I just wanted to call out because it does seem like there will be some some ability to look back at, at expenses already incurred since the reference is March 1st, 2020, rather than like the date that you receive the grant, which uh, again is a difference from the, compared to the PPP. Okay, prohibited expenses, cannot use the grant to go out and buy uh, new real estate or any real estate. You cannot uh, make payments on any debt that you first originated or incurred after February 15th, 2020. I think there was a question in advance about that that might've been refinanced after that date. Um, and we'll have to see what SBA says, if anything about whether that refinanced debt would still be ineligible since I think it technically would have been originated after February 15th, even though it's, you know, it, the debt that was refinanced predates that. So no, no good answer to that right now, but we'll see. Cannot invest the grant funds or relend them to some other entity or um, business partner, for example. You can't use them for political contributions or any other use prohibited by SBA. I've kind of alluded to this a couple of times so far, but there are two priority windows of SBO grants for the first 28 days overall after they launch the, the program. During the first two weeks, the first 14-day period, SBA will only make grants to entities that experienced a 90% or greater decline in their revenue um, from April 1 through December 31st, 2020, compared to that corresponding period in 2019. So that would be, you know, the very, the very hardest hit uh, in terms of revenue, at least of the, the bar or the, uh, I keep saying borrowers, because that's the, the term we would use for the PPP. This is not a loan. So it's the, the grant recipient. That would be the hardest hit of the eligible grant recipients. Um, and then the second priority would be uh, the next 14 day period for those eligible entities that had a 70% or greater decline in revenue based on those same comparable time periods. And then after that, after that first 20 day, eight day period, any eligible recipient, which would be any, any one who hits that 25% or greater decline for any 2020 quarter compared to 2019, they would then be eligible to receive a grant. Um, subject to funding availability, I guess. And then the, the act does specifically note that any other CARES Act revenue that might've been received, and this, this I guess would include prior PPP loans, would not count toward those calculations. Um, so if you previously received the PPP loan and are, but don't do that going forward for a second round loan, uh, at least the way the statute's written, that PPP loan won't even count toward your your revenue for these purposes. Um, it'll be worth confirming that the SBA doesn't overrule that somehow, um, but that's the way the statute is written anyway. And that would the same would be true of any other CARES Act funding. It's not limited to the PPP. And then uh, there's a note that for this test anyway, um, the revenue should be determined using uh, the accrual method uh, of accounting. So I think the uh, I think the SBA has authority to tweak that if they need to. So for example, there might be some smaller grant recipients that 
that might use like a cash method based accounting and not accrual. So there may be some exceptions ultimately, but the statute contemplates that for the most part, it would be accrual based accounting. Okay, and then um, on the tax front, it's basically um, the same for those who are familiar with the PPP, it's basically the same outcome here. The, the grant itself will not, at least at the federal level, result in um, taxable income to the recipient under the statutory language uh, that's specifically provided for. And then also like the PPP, but this way the stimulus bill says that as long as an expense that was funded by one of these grants is otherwise deductible for federal purposes, uh, the, the fact that it was funded with an SVO grant will not make it non-deductible. And that, that overrules some corresponding or supersedes some kind of corresponding guidance that had been released by the IRS over the last few months in the context of PPP loans. So basically at the federal level anyway, the receipt of the grant and then the deductibility of the expenses are both, uh, uh, that you, you get favorable treatment. If you're a grant recipient, you won't be taxed on the grant and you'll still be able to take the deductions um, for the grant funded expenses. However, um, states and other municipalities don't necessarily need to follow that approach. So there could be some state or local level tax exposure um, relating to SBO grants, which is something to probably talk to your accountants about um, as you progress through this. And if you do receive an SBO grant, it could result in some difference between state and federal taxes potentially. And so we'll just have to see how that how that tracks at each, you know, for each state. Okay, um, so we're beginning to wrap up here. I just want to include some cautions and warnings, sort of lessons learned, the big picture for those who may not have closely followed the Paycheck Protection Program because they determined they were not eligible or, or for any other reason. You just, you want to be aware that, you, you know, if you do receive a grant, that's likely to become public information or knowledge one way or another, whether it's through the government reporting or reports to Congress that are required under the act or through uh, Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, so just something that you wanna be mindful of. And then similarly, um, well, this is not similar. The fact that, that it's public knowledge has nothing to do with whether there was any kind of fraud or misuse of funds, but you should also be aware that there are significant appropriations in in the new legislation for SBA to monitor for fraud, misuse of funds, any kind of misrepresentations or similar issues, and that there there can be significant civil or criminal fines or sanctions for that um, kind of uh, bad behavior. I don't think you know. Uh, I know from my experience working with borrowers that nobody I've worked with has gone in with the intention to bump up against any of those guardrails, really. Um, but the PPP was obviously a very fluid situation with the rules constantly changing. And I know a lot of clients got concerned after the fact when subsequent guidance, you know, might might have caused them to have doubts about whether they really needed the loan, for example. So the, you know, I think the advice that we give in that context and that I would give here is just to make sure you're creating a contemporaneous record of your eligibility and why you need the funds, um, how you, you know, why you can make the different certifications, especially the need certification um, to just backstop your compliance with the program terms. Uh, and then final concluding remarks, it's gonna take a little while, I would guess, for SBA to get this program up and running again, because it's not really a matter of just restarting an existing program like the PPP, um, which, you know, that will not be a simple task, even though it's already operated in the past, they're gonna have to adapt all the rules for the PPP that have been changed. But it's not like they're just gonna turn back on a light switch here that that had been off for a while. This is an entirely new program. So uh, 
they're going to have to write all the rules and get the logistics uh, in place for collecting necessary information and validating amounts. So there was, you know, I just caution that some patience may be required here, but I think SBA also wants to move quickly to to get the funds out there. So we'll see how they balance those those two factors. Um, and then, as I mentioned a few times, just very important to track the rulemaking and FAQs that SBA will likely put out because those can really change or or color one's interpretation of the legislation. In the PPP context, they most certainly, you know, definitely imposed additional eligibility right requirements uh, that were not included in the CARES Act when they rolled out the program. So very important to keep an eye on that. We will, I'm sure, do that as well at Noah Johnson and continue to do updates and webinars as appropriate. And then while you're waiting, you know, make sure you collect information about, you know, your eligibility, how you fit into one of those buckets, if you do, um, of potential grant recipients, and then how you would calculate your grant amount the decline in your revenue, you know, to establish whether you would fit into one of those first two priority funding rounds. So you you, know, you have some time to collect the information to be in a good place to apply for the grant once it, the program does open up. And then lastly, you know, make sure you consult counsel, accountants, any financial advisors that, you know, are trusted advisors for you or familiar with your operations to, to make sure you're addressing any specific concerns or questions you might have about your particular circumstances. I think it's very important to draw on, and I'm not just saying that as an attorney uh, that one might consult, but just in general, to talk with these advisors who are working with other clients that, that are in analogous situations, and they might have seen this question before that you have. So, you know, draw on the knowledge of, of your trusted advisors if you do have questions or concerns about anything related to the program. So with that, uh, I think I'll conclude the webinar. Looks like there are a couple of questions and we've got a little time left here. There's a picture of me with my contact information. You should feel free to reach out to me if, if you'd like to. Um, I'll do my best to answer these questions that we have and any that I might receive via email. Um, Bear with me if I can't answer the questions, please. You know, kind of pending the SBA guidance coming out. Uh, so one question that came across during the webinar is whether revenue from a wholly owned subsidiary is included in the calculation for the grant amount in the priority period to apply for the grant. Uh, if the wholly owned subsidiary is not the same shuttered venue business. Um, I don't know the answer to that question right now. I would expect that if this were the PPP context, I would definitely err on the side of affiliates being included in most calculations of revenue, including wholly owned subsidiaries. But again, this program is, is different in the sense that the legislation itself addresses more specifically the idea that you could have multiple affiliated entities, each receiving a, a separate grant. So I, I, I can't really answer that question until we get better SBA guidance on these sorts of questions, just the, the topic of subsidiaries in general, but then also more specifically, you know, if you have an un, a subsidiary or a related company that's not a shuttered venue, how does that impact your eligibility or your your ability to be a priority grant recipient. I, I, I'm not sure how SBA will come down on that at this point. That's a very good question though. Um, and then there's another question that says, since the SBO grant is better option for our business compared to the PPP, we can only apply for one. Our concern is that if we apply for SBO and are not selected, and it may be too late to still apply and receive a PPP loan. Do you have a recommendation on timing? And is there any info on the time frame for SVO decisions in order to still be able to apply for PPP? 
Yeah, that's a tricky, tricky one. I don't have any insight about when the SVO will actually launch in order to accept applications other than my sense is it'll probably be later than when they relaunch the PPP. And so there will be a bit of a conundrum there about, you know, do you, do you try to get in line first to apply for a PPP versus potentially waiting for the better SVO grant option and risk, you know, that the funding may run out on you. Um, for now, I don't have a great answer on that, other than I think you've, whoever asked that question has correctly identified um, a possible, you, you know, decision that, that people are going to have to make early if, if SBA doesn't provide some, you know, avenue to potentially apply for a PPP loan, say, pending a determination on SVO grants. I don't know that they will do that. It seems like that would be a good thing and a prudent thing for SBA to do is to allow an SVO grant eligible recipient to at least apply for a PPP loan and maybe even receive it and then return it if they ultimately became SVO grant eligible. But that's all speculation on my part um, that SBA would do something like that. I think this issue probably will be out there for enough borrowers that hopefully they give it some thought before they relaunch the program, but I, I wouldn't necessarily count on it. So I think this is one of those situations where there's probably not one right answer for, for everybody who might be eligible for both. And it might depend on how big a difference there is in terms of the potential benefit between the PPP versus the SVO grant for that particular business um, or that particular eligible recipient, you know, for, for cases where it's relatively close in terms of the benefit, you, you may want to go and just apply for the PPP loan if that does reopen much sooner than the SVO grant. If the, if the gulf in benefit is potentially much greater than, you know, obviously I think that probably weighs more favorably toward, toward waiting. Um, and uh, I think it's important to keep in mind the different earmarks or set asides um, under each of the different programs, depending on what type of business you are. You know, there may be some funds set aside in the PPP appropriations that, that give you some, uh, that, that mitigate some of your concerns that uh, the appropriations might not still be available for you. So if you're a super small, you know, fewer than 10 employees, for example, or if um, you're in a low income, area and you're a hard hit business, then, then there may be some set asides in the PPP funding that give you a little more comfort that the funding will still be available. Uh, but that's a really good, a really good observation and question raised about you know, how you proceed in that circumstance. And again, I think it's just going to be an individualized thing. So I would keep an eye on, on the implementation and the rulemaking that comes down in the coming days and weeks, but also try to get a better, you know, as best to handle as you can on, on kind of what amount you would receive under each program and how flexible your ability to use those funds would be. Okay, um, doesn't look like there are any more questions here. As I mentioned, we will uh, keep people up to date with follow-up webinars, um, both the PPP and SBO grant program, as well as uh, beginning next week, some of my employment law colleagues and I'm sure our tax colleagues will ultimately uh, be, be putting on webinars in uh, other areas related to the new legislation, such as um, FFCRA, consider, you know, the, the voluntary extension of that program, which are kind of outside the scope of my expertise, but have uh, colleagues who are very up to date on what's what's going on with other aspects of the legislation. So, uh, highly recommend you consider attending those webinars as well. So, with that, I will uh, just thank everybody once again for joining today, as well as joining so many other times during 2020. Um, it's been a tough year for for everybody and. Uh, 
just speaking for myself and I'll venture to speak on behalf of other Miller Johnson attorneys. We really have appreciated uh, the community's involvement in our webinars and engagement uh, with our, our different COVID-19 work streams. So thank you so much. And a um, uh, bigger uh, big thank you as well to all the um, healthcare workers and other essential workers who are not on, on the webinar and who are doing such important work for our community so that the rest of us can continue to, you know, work on our businesses and uh, try to keep uh, kind of economic livelihood going. So I hope you have a great 2021 uh, New Year's and start to your year. Stay safe and healthy, and uh, we'll talk to you again next year. Thank you.